Hello and welcome. If you can please silence all electronic devices. And we do have open seats down front if you're still looking for a place to sit. And realize the session is being recorded. Okay, so let's begin. Um, I will allow Michael Mabe to introduce himself as you wish. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, many of you will remember, or those of you who do remember me, uh, as being at a number of different publishing houses and more recently, the last 13 and a half years, working as CEO of STM. The first thing to say is I'm here in a private and personal capacity um, and the views I'm going to express will be entirely my own and are not meant to be representative of any other body, uh, living or dead. Um, I want to give a big thanks to um, Katina, who uh, invited me to come and do this. And she invited me to come and do this on the sixth day of my retirement. So um, I wonder what happens on the seventh. Um, we're here in a Neapolitan, which um, certainly where I come from is a type of ice cream that looks like the colours of the Italian flag. And those, of course, are um, green, white and red. And as we're in the middle, I'm assuming that must mean we're the white one. So that means we must be the vanilla room. Um, I've been asked to give a view about what's going on in Europe and in particular about issues connected with uh, Plan S uh, and similar matters. And when I was thinking about what to call this, um, the phrase or the, rather the word Eurovision immediately came to mind. Now, I suspect the word Eurovision has been copyrighted by the European Broadcasting Union, as many of you will be familiar with a little event that happens every year called the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, this is a festival of rather camp uh, uh, <laughs> songs, uh, but it covers more than just Europe, because um, in recent years, uh, it's been won by an Israeli transvestite, and the last time uh, the uh, event happened was, as you can see, in Tel Aviv. And the reason this is relevant is because although I'm giving you a Eurovision like the song contest, I'm going to probably go a little bit further than the boundaries of Europe towards the end. Now, to try and put these developments that are going on in a type of context, which has always been an important uh, way of proceeding for me, certainly, we have to look at the sort of environment that we're in and the causative factors that are contributing to some of the issues and policy debates that are now before us. And these are arising from a number of factors. One of them is the nature of scholarly communication and how it's been developing. The other is the consequences which we are all living with in terms of the digital transition. Um, we haven't fully adapted to it yet, but we're certainly further along than we were. And in particular, how open access has developed and continues to develop. Now, any data that you see in, in my slides actually comes from the 2018 edition, the fifth edition of the STM report, which I co-authored with Rob Johnson and Anthony Watkinson, who I know is familiar to many at the Charleston Library Conferences. And these first two um, slides are essentially just to show you that we are still in a phase of considerable growth. Total number of journals, peer-reviewed, active, scholarly, is about 33,000 at the moment, and it continues to grow at about 3.5% by title every year. And it's worth saying that that growth is probably slightly higher because some of those titles fall by the wayside. But those that uh, are started and survive uh, have been expanding at about 3.5% every year for the last 300 years. And remember that 300 years, because I'm going to come back to it in a moment. At the same time, article growth has also been uh, fairly healthy at 3% per annum. And the latest estimates are that there's about 3.5 million scholarly articles out there um, shared amongst the different journals that are publishing them. 
Now, of course, the immediate question that everybody comes to is what's behind all of this growth? And it's a very easy thing to think that everything boils down to money, but I don't think that's actually the case. If you look at a log-log plot of um, the number of articles published in 2008 against the gross R&D expenditure for the same year, while there is a sort of correlation between um, uh, money in and articles out, it's by no means a linear correlation. And in some cases, some people are getting many more articles out for the same amount of money than others. So it's not really a straightforward relationship. What is a much more straightforward relationship, however, is that the number of titles, the number of journal articles, and the number of researchers are intimately linked. And although this is a very old chart, because unfortunately it comes from National Science Foundation data that doesn't always get repeated in later years, you can find very similar uh, results from OECD material, and we do in fact quote that in the STM report. But the key thing is, that there are, as there are more researchers, there are more articles, and as there are more articles, there are more journals. So the main causative factor of the growth is actually the number of people doing research. Now, we're dealing in a, with a world of uh, now, in, almost uh, increasingly now, with um, open access and the degree to which that's now penetrated that universe of three and a half million articles. And it's worth reflecting on, on how we got where we are. Open access publishing has been around for at least 20 years. And where there were business models, the early ones were pay to publish. That landscape has become more and more complicated. And the reason why that complexity is something that we have to take into account is because it feeds into the difficulties of policy creation and implementation that face funders, governments, universities, and learned societies. One way of looking at the open access universe, and I know that many others have um, commented already at this conference on this, based upon what I've seen on the Twitter feeds, um, we can think of it really in two dimensions. You can think of where there is an article publication charge and where there isn't, and where there is a subscription and where there isn't. And when you put that together in this uh, uh, chart that I'm showing here, you can see that the pure gold open access, that is to say the pay-to-publish um, journal, is not only a place where there's no subscription, but it is a place where there is an article publication charge. But equally, you can have subscription journals where there can be, for payment, um, an open access article or more than one open access article. And for convention, we've called these hybrids. Hybrid gold would probably be better, but I think on balance, they're usually called hybrids. Where there's no subscription and no article publication charge, one can think of this as subsidized um, or zero APC uh, journals. And while there are a few of those, they're by no means the majority, and they usually reflect on um, the activities of government departments and, and similar bodies who are essentially making journals available as part of their remit. And lastly, we have um, the traditional subscription environment, the uh, electronic licensing of, of subscription journals, which are the only way of getting hold of them, and they have no article publication charge. Now, to these uh, gold-related and subscription-related models has been added self-archiving. And self-archiving is usually done after a delay, and the article versions that are archived uh, vary, but are usually the accepted author manuscripts, if not the final um, published uh, items. And I've dubbed this the nobody pays model, because although it is a form of providing access, it depends crucially on the assumption that if you make that access available at increasingly smaller and smaller embargo periods, that you don't in any way uh, undermine the economic model of the journal, which is usually a subscription. There are other more complicated approaches, um, which uh, many of you will have seen. One of them is the delayed access to a subscription journal after an embargo period. And this was something that was introduced by the DC principles uh, organization at the beginning of the NIH 
uh, mandates that came out in the early part of this century. And there's also even more complicated ones. I've seen publishers where uh, one could call this the peekaboo model, where things appear free initially, but then disappear behind a paywall later on. So this is a complicated environment that we're in, and it's not just complicated for publishers and librarians, it's equally complicated for the researchers and for the research administrators. The penetration by nation is also extremely variable. Um, this is data from the European Commission Open Science Monitor from last year, and it shows that while in Europe and the United States you could look at there being about 35% of articles being available open access, and the green and the orange here reflect green and gold. Um, at the other end of the, the tail, down at the bottom with uh, Greece and China, you're looking at a much lower percentage. You're looking at more like um, 15 to 20%. So there is a big variation around the world. And there's also a very big variation by subject. Um, this is work that Bjork did a few years ago, but I think is still current and accurate, showing that the biomedical sciences, where, of course, there are grants that allow for the payment of pay-to-publish um, APCs, are very much more inclined to have uh, gold OA publishing than other parts of the sciences. And here we're contrasting effectively uh, the biomedical with the, the, the hard sciences. Now, there are a number of issues that we've all had to deal with over the last 20 years and which are feeding into the policy debates. And I mention them again here because I think if we can take these on board, it'll make understanding some of the complications of what people are trying to do and indeed judging whether we think they're going to be successful somewhat easier. So as I said, the earliest models that were introduced were um, pay to publish, which have now been dubbed gold. And the very early debates, and I remember being here in Charleston in 2001, I think it was, were about cost and the fact that uh, despite the obvious advantages of going open access, there was relatively low take-up by the scholarly community. That take-up was helped with the development of what were known as choice or optional and what we've now defined as the hybrid model. That's to say authors could choose to make their article open access even within an existing subscription journal by paying an optional payment, usually via their grants or, or via their institution, not usually by themselves. And the advantages that this has is it enabled authors to publish in their preferred journal, which most surveys suggest is the most important thing to them, is the being able to choose the particular outlet that they want, but also to do so in, a, in an open access way that would satisfy the requirements of their funding body. And currently, of that 3.5 million articles in the world each year, about 15% of them are actually gold, and it's estimated that somewhere between 11 and 12% of them are actually hybrid gold rather than uh, sitting in pure gold journals. Now, the discussion shifted pretty rapidly after the first um, opening salvos about uh, whether, green, whether gold would be taken up and how much did it cost to the idea of self-archiving on repositories, which we now call green. And this depends upon issues related to the type of version being, ar uh, being archived. And usually there's been a coalescence around the idea of using the author's peer-reviewed but not final versions. So in other words, the, the author's accepted manuscript in the uh, NISO uh, nomenclature. And also, whether there was a de delay after publication called an embargo period. And a huge amount of uh, time and energy and angst has been expended at conferences like this, trying to prove or not prove whether or not 18 months, 12 months, or six months have a deleterious effect on the subscriptions that that journal depends upon to remain viable. Now, at the same time, the research funders had decided that actually on balance, they would prefer the final versions, and actually they'd prefer them immediately on publication. 
and they also wanted to be able to reuse them, so using CC BY and equivalent licenses. And that meant they essentially came down in favour of gold. It still remains unclear how harmful very short embargo green would be. There isn't hard and fast evidence. But clearly the rin SEPA study, called Heading for the Open Road, that was published back in about uh, 2010, I think, from memory, um, concluded that green was inherently unstable because financial support of the journal depended solely upon subscriptions being maintained, and it wasn't clear as you approached that zero embargo whether in fact people would continue to pay for something that they could get a slightly inferior version of for free. Now over the period that uh, preceding all of these big uh, developments in terms of policy that I'm going to talk about shortly, we've seen a considerable change in publishing models. And this is a chart taken from Universities UK's 2017 uh, report monitoring the transition to open access. And what you can see here, and this is looking at journals, not at articles, I hasten to add, that the number of pure gold with an APC uh, journals has increased by 50% from about 7% up to just under 10. The number of gold with no APC, so essentially sponsored uh, journals, has remained virtually static. But there has been a huge increase in the number of subscription journals that have added the hybrid option. Uh, and I imagine this is under the pressure that exists for to give authors two things, their preferred outlet and to be able to say that they had done it open access. And you can see that the minority model, although it's still a large minority, is actually subscription only. Now, it's worth taking a bit of a, a sidebar at this point to think a little bit about hybrids and some of the issues that have been raised about hybrids, and in particular, the way this is actually flowing into discussions about offsetting, which again, I know, is a theme we've seen around the industry and indeed at this conference. And, and this slide is something I put together for a, a lecture I gave to Carol Tenapier's um, College of Communication graduate class uh, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville to try and explain to them why, in fact, hybrids and double dipping were misunderstandings, um, although they are obviously perceptions that exist. And in fact, I remember in my previous existence having to try very hard to persuade the previous but one president of Science Europe, which is the overall um, body that brings together all the um, research funders in Europe, that in fact hybrid didn't necessarily mean double payment. But I was unable to convince him. I, I have a go at trying to convince you here, but this is just a thought experiment, as, as Einstein would have said. And you've got to think that on the left-hand side of the chart is the domain of the local. And we're dealing with local universities, local access. On the right-hand side of the chart, we're dealing with the global view, where everybody in the world has access. So let's consider a, a hypothetical journal um, that's uh, on the left-hand side. It's a library subscription or licensing model. We'll just say for the sake of argument that it's a thousand dollar subscription and it's got a hundred subscribers globally. Or we could consider that journal as a fully open access journal where it charges two thousand dollars APC and publishes 50 papers per annum. The reality is that in both cases, with which whatever the model that's adopted, the publisher income is identical. It's a, a thousand times a hundred on one side, and it's two thousand times fifty on the other, both equaling a hundred thousand. Now let's take the view that the subscription journal on the left decides to go hybrid, and it decides to go hybrid with the same APC that the fully um, gold one had. And they agreed not to double dip, which indeed is the agreement that virtually all publishers have now. That is to say, they will reduce the subscription price based upon the amount of open access take up. What does that mean in practice? Well, the first thing is, let's make it really simple. Let's assume there's only one article that actually is, is made hybrid in the subscription journal. 
That income is $2,000, and that's for this global uh, ability to see that journal everywhere and that article everywhere in the world. Because we're not double dipping, we're now going to subtract that 2000 from all the revenue that had been received or could have been received under the subscription model and create a discount. What does that mean? Well, there's 2000 divided amongst the 100 subscribers, so that's $20 a subscriber. Take that off of the 1000 and you're left with 980 So you have a situation where everyone in the world is paying less, but one institution that's got one author who decided to go uh, hybrid is paying that 980 but in addition, depending on which budget, of course, it comes out of, and of course it may be a completely different pot, um, the institutional amount there is 2980 But the situation is exactly the same from the publisher's perspective. There is no difference in income, whether or not that one article went hybrid or more than one article went hybrid because the one cancelled out the other. But there is a very considerable difference locally for that particular university where they have had a reduction in their um, subscription fee, but they have also seen an increase in their open access charge. And the two of these things together has created a very strong perception that at the local level, it looks like they're paying twice now, they aren't actually paying twice, but the heart of this, the real heart of this, and the challenge that we all of us face is that if you then move into an offsetting or a publish and read, publish and read environment, you're trying to balance a service to one institution in one location versus a service to the entire world. And actually, if you try and do the maths, it doesn't work out. So all of it has to be a form of experimentation. And like all forms of experimentation, what might work in a limited way in one area doesn't necessarily work if you try and apply it across the board. So anyway, that, that's, that's the, uh, the argument, which I'm not sure I was very successful in uh, trying to push forward, but it is the one that I believe to be the case. Now, the other thing that's happened that's feeding into the policy discussions is, of course, the OA 2020 uh, initiative. And this is a Max Planck Digital Library campaign created in 2016 and was based upon their uh, 2015 white paper. Uh, this proposed a flip to an OA-only global world by 2020. And they reckoned that there was enough money in the current system to do this. Now, as it happens, um, I think they're right. There is enough money in the current system to do this. But where they're wrong is this idea that this is a simple flip, that you just turn a button and you flipped from state A to state B. And the reason why I think this is complicated is because you have essentially an inequality problem. If you think about how in a purely subscription world those costs are shared around and distributed around all the institutions involved, while not everybody's paying the same, most people are paying something. And that something is correlated roughly by the size of that institution. Flipping to gold changes the way those costs are concentrated. And essentially, it moves them into those who produce the most research will pay the highest amount. Whereas those who either don't consume or um, have very low consumption um, but no research output, they no longer uh, need to pay because they're not producing the articles. But equally, they're then sitting on some money that they were using for subscriptions, which actually probably, in, a, in an ideal world, you'd want to give to the people who are now bearing a bigger load than they were. And so the big political question that this generates is, would small institutions give their no longer needed subscription funds to the larger ones to pay for open access? I mean, I think you can all see the difficulties that would cause. But even at the level of the country, if you're Botswana and you have decided that, uh, you know, that you're in this situation where you're getting an awful lot of stuff for free, but you did pay for some of it, 
how do you feel about the idea that you might have to transfer some of that money to support the system elsewhere? I think you can see that politically this becomes very, very hot very quickly. And it's compounded by the free rider problem. So, for example, if you don't have a world that changes overnight from state A to state B, say you have Europe goes gold completely but the rest of the world doesn't, if one region flips first, why shouldn't another say, thank you very much, get their research for free, but still insist on charging for access to their research? And I think this is a situation that is potentially nascent in China, for example. And then there's the corporate research dimension. Um, I reckon about 10% of research is consumed by large industrial research organisations that publish very little and their funds would be lost in such a transition. So the, the issue will be, if that 10% that was supporting the system disappears, it will mean it's going to have to be borne by those that do pay. And of course, that's increasing the load on those larger institutions that are essentially going to be the people who support uh, a gold universe. Now, there was a solution proposed to this, and the solution was proposed by the California Digital Library, and it was called the pay it forward approach. And here it was recognized that the idea of getting small institutions to, to hand over their money to the large was just simply not going to work. But that if you got everybody to pay what they currently pay into an intermediary, and then that intermediary bought the open access, then that allows you to have this transition and to avoid some of the political hot potatoes. And while there was discussions going on uh, in, with the uh, open access czar of the European Commission, Robert Jan Smits, I did actually meet with him and say that actually the, the biggest barrier to a big flip to OA was this political money distribution problem and why didn't we do a European version of pay it forward? Well, he, he didn't really think that that's what he wanted to do and certainly uh, within a few months of making that suggestion, this is what happened. Um, Plan S comes from all the stuff I've talked about before. It's an example of frustration with the slow uptake of open access and a frustration that I think doesn't accurately reflect the realities on the ground, but nonetheless. It was the joint idea of Science Europe, the Association of European Funders, and the European Commission Open Access Czar, Robert Jan Smits. And the first version was proposed in September of last year. And the original proposition was that by 2020, scientific publications that resulted from research funded by public grants must be published in compliant open access journals or platforms. And in this context, compliant meant free to read immediately upon publication in an OA journal or via zero embargo deposits in repositories, that copyright was to remain with the author, that hybrid open access was not supported, and additionally, it was intended that there would be price caps and this was in the document, even though uh, various parts of the Commission had pointed out that these broke competition law and would probably not survive in later versions. Uh, the reactions were, as I'm sure you all know, quite uh, extreme. Um, Nature, on the 4th of September, wrote, as written, Plan S would bar researchers from publishing in 85% of journals including influential titles such as Nature and Science. Now, the, the reason they've said that, of course, is because Nature and Science don't currently um, allow full OA and don't even have hybrid options. So for them, Plan S, insisting on OA journals and no hybrid, doesn't give them very many options. The reactions of researchers were also somewhat sceptical. Um, Plan S, too far, too risky. And this was an open letter from 1,800 researchers, and I think it's now a very, very large number more than that, that was first issued in November 2018. And their points that they made were the complete ban on hybrid society journals of high quality is a big problem. 
We expect that a large part of the world will not fully tie in with Plan S. And Plan S ignores the existence of large differences between different research fields. Plan S, in their view, was a serious violation of academic freedom. These concerns were echoed by the arts and humanities scholars who um, said, uh, not entirely tongue in cheek, that Plan S was only about S, by which they meant science, and that it overlooked the different economic uh, environments that many disciplines operate in, where grants are not that common, and where the idea that you should be able to come up with um, a pay to publish model perhaps is not as well developed. For the publishers, most of them said, well, we actually you know, don't disagree with the aims here, but they were concerned about the details in the same way that the researchers were concerned about the details. This year, um, Plan S held consultations in the early part of 2019. And the implementation plans um, altered in June. The start date was pushed back from 2020 to 2021. Hybrid was given uh, a bit more of, a, of, a, of a, an allowed existence by being part of transformative agreements that would be allowed to be in place until 2024. But the insistence on gold or zero embargo green were still the main allowed routes. And it's important to note that as of the time I'm speaking, Plan S still only has half of the Science Europe funders signed up. It does not include the main funders in Germany or France. And despite warm noises being made in certain quarters, China, Japan and India have not signed. And there's been no sign of sign up in the US among its agencies either. Now this does not mean that various individuals connected with the research organisations have not expressed their uh, in principle support. But that's slightly different from them actually agreeing to all the principles and signing up to it. And the 10 principles which Plan S has at the moment uh, are these. They are the author should retain copyright and they prefer a CC by licence, which incidentally is not always the most popular licence if you were to speak to authors. They will develop criteria um, that for the high quality services which the OA outlets must provide. Where those outlets don't exist, they'll try and create incentives to create them. Um, that the article publication charges will be covered by the funders or their institutions. Although again, this is, it's not clear how that necessarily works in the arts and humanities area, where such funding is, is much less common. Um, that they supported our diversity of business models, but that the APCs must be commensurate with services offered. Well, the only problem with the diversity of business models is that zero embargo green is not necessarily a realistic alternative. And so that effectively, they're really saying gold. Funders were going to encourage everybody to align their policies for transparency, and that's a really important point because certainly we live in a global scholarly environment and the idea that every country and every funder might have a different policy, which of course is, I'm afraid, where we are, um, would be a bit of a nightmare for anybody trying to administer this, be they a researcher, be they an institution, be they a publisher. They want to apply their principles to all scholarly publications, not just journals, but books as well. Um, but that they recognise that OA for books will take longer. Hybrid OA is still not supported, but is seen as a route to full open access as part of transformative agreements that may contribute financially to the viability of the journal. Funders are going to monitor compliance and sanction non-compliance. And the assessment of research outputs will be based on the intrinsic merit of the work not the publication channel, its impact factor, or other journal metrics, or the publisher. And as many of you will know, if you've seen the research that's been done over the years, some of this runs distinctly counter to common academic behaviour and practice. So in this year, concerns as of now 
remain, both for academics and publishers. Hazel Cox, who's a professor of theoretical and computational quantum physics at the University of Sussex, wrote in a, a Royal Society of Chemistry magazine, most people would agree that Plan S is a good idea in principle. It's just the implementation. Yes, they've extended it to 2021, but it's still very rushed. It's a global issue. Until everyone is on board, people are going to be limited in where and how they publish. And Kevin, Kelvin Drogemeyer, the US uh, Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, said, one of the things this government will not do is to tell researchers where they have to publish their papers. That is absolutely up to the scholar who's doing the publication. There's just no question about that. Now, I'm going to move on to the EU and its involvement in all of this, because it's not just a regional government, it's also a funder. And there are some interesting uh, parallelisms before I come back to give you some kind of um, conclusion. Now, the EU itself is a complicated, multifaceted institution. And when I was first invited to give this talk, I had a feeling I was not going to be uh, from a country that was part of it by the time we got here. <laughs> but clearly, that's not happened yet. And no, I don't want to talk to anybody about Brexit. Thank you very much. Um, but the European Union is made up of three components. It's made up of the executive leadership by the heads of the governments of the still 28 member states. That's called the European Council. It's then made up by a permanent body called the European Commission that's effectively the government of the EU, government administration. And, and in that sense, it's very similar to US federal government departments and for cabinet secretaries, read commissioners. The commission gets renewed every five years following parliamentary elections. Um, and one commissioner is given to each member state uh, and their, their position is ratified by the parliament. And the parliament is then directly elected by EU citizens in five yearly elections. And we've just had an election back in uh, June, July, and the latest commission has just taken office on the 1st of November. And you need all these three bits together to make laws. Why does that matter for this discussion? Because European research programs are essentially established by law, established by the acts of those three bodies together. And the European Union bundles its research programs into what are known as framework programs. And these now run for seven years. And they're done so to synchronize with um, the multi-financial framework, which is Euro-speak for the EU budget. Why do, we, do they want to do this? Because they want to encourage cross-border research and development to support innovation for European industries and have a direct benefit for European citizens. And how do they do it? Well, effectively, it's uh, regulation, and then there are rules for participation and dissemination. And it's those rules which will eventually dictate how uh, individual researchers have to proceed to get their grants and to be able to, to publish, and the rules under which they do. Um, we're in Horizon 2020 at the moment. And inevitably, or that because there's lots of grants being given over the seven years, there's a slow build-up of articles coming out of this. Those articles are going to continue to build up after uh, Horizon 2020 is, is dead and buried. But there is a, very, a significant amount of research, about 5%, I would think, of, of some of the world's output is, is, is coming via EU funding. The next program is going to be called Horizon Europe, just to make it um, simple. Um, and it's called FP9, Framework Program 9. And they have quite a lot in common. They're both seven years. They're both based on a legislative act. They both have three strands or pillars. And you can see these here. The current one is uh, divided into nearly 25 billion euros for excellence in science, 17 billion for industrial leadership, 30 billion for societal challenges. And you have the same sort of three things in the new program, where in particular they're making an emphasis on open science. They're looking at five global challenge clusters, so health, digital industry, climate, etc. And they're also very keen on open innovation. But the key thing about Horizon Europe is that it will, at least in part, align with Plan S. 
And it's worth saying that although this is happening, the EU as an institution, or rather the Commission, has not actually formally signed up to Plan S, even though it was one of their people who were involved in putting it together. So there's a certain amount of ambiguity there, which again, it's not clear to me how to interpret that. They will require immediate open access, and if people to go down the green route, they want a zero embargo. Hybrid is not disallowed, but it won't be funded. And all of this still needs to be approved by the European Parliament, but that's going through in the next um, few months. So to put all this together, we have a current situation that's essentially rather complex. Um, Plan S has got everybody talking about it, has got lots of people worried, and it all hinges on what you believe or what is agreed to be a transformative agreement. It's looking like it's going to be fairly regional. Now, most publishers are global and have to deal with authors and readers around and, and libraries around the whole world. But it's looking like Europe, given what I've just said about the funding of the EEC, that the funding and, and the, the, the general um, outlines are going to go the Plan S way. But there's lack of uniformity even there. And as I said earlier, Germany and France and some others are, are, are still outside, and this means uncertainty. And uncertainty means confusion, as you heard from the professor earlier, who didn't know quite how it was all going to work out for her and her colleagues. And the US, China, and Japan are not part of this. So Europe's quite important. It's about 25% of the world's output. But it's not the only output. It's also unclear how scholars and publishers are going to be able to work in this environment because we're not just dealing with different institutions, even in the same region, but those institutions may themselves have different interpretations. Um, at this conference, I know Alicia Wise has been talking about her work with uh, Information Power, which has been working with Wellcome and UKRI and partnering with Alps to create a toolkit for societies to move to immediate open access and enter into transformative agreements. And this clearly is something which the learned society sector desperately needs. Um, although, again, I would suggest that um, they're trying to align themselves with something that's cur currently changing before our eyes uh, as we speak. It's not a global thing. It's not even a, a firm and decided thing, even in Europe. So discussions are going to continue, and individual publishers have been discussing with Plan S, but the complications of competition law mean that if those publishers try to get together and talk collectively, they can't do it. It's actually breaking antitrust regulations, and that's an additional complicating factor. So in terms of how this is going to develop, I'm afraid I don't have a conclusion. You're going to have to watch this space. But I promised earlier that Eurovision was more than just Europe. And you saw that in the song contest, it includes the Israelis as well. Well, we have to include China in our discussions. China is probably even more important than Plan S. It's been the world's largest economy since 2015. It has the world's largest R&D spend, currently running at about 38% of the world total, 38%. Um, and since 2016, it's been the largest national producer of papers, 19% versus the US on 18, and that trend is going to continue. It used to be thought that a lot of this was lots of quantity and not a lot of quality, but it now ranks second in terms of share of citations, and it ranks third if you're looking at the top 1% cited publications. Now, the industry out there is surprisingly old-fashioned. Um, a lot of uh, Chinese journals are run by their editors. They don't understand that distinction between publisher and editor that's so well established in the rest of the world. But they're also concerned that as part of the developments that are going on to develop their economy uh, and to make them the leading nation in the world, they want to do something about that. 
And as part of Xi Jinping's Made in China 2025 initiative, the Chinese Association of Science and Technology, the National Science Foundation China, the um, Chinese, Association, uh, Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences, the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Science and Technology have published a joint report on improving Chinese science journals. And this was published in August, only in Mandarin, I might add, but I have managed to get uh, a translation. And this particular report recognizes the antiquated nature of Chinese journals. It wants to make China a publishing powerhouse. I think that's an ambitious goal. It sees state-run journals as the route. Well, that's what you'd expect from uh, Xi Jinping, who is clearly not of the Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, cast of mind about, you know, let's get rich and not bother too much about communism. And they do recognize that there are limitations that must apply. And that if they don't uh, do, uh, if they don't collaborate internationally, then the quality of what they're producing will inevitably decline. And this is a point that I've made uh, on several occasions to various uh, people who are involved in the ministries about this, that the best science in the world, the best scholarship in the world, is multinational national and collaborative. So the idea of merely having Chinese papers in Chinese journals is not necessarily going to help them that much. And it puts me in mind of a, of a story that I heard from my Oxford landlady, who, who was the um, widow of Sir Francis Simon, who helped uh, develop the atomic bomb in Los Alamos. And his students were very eminent British scientists, and they all went um, to see uh, the, the Secretary of State for Science and Education. And one group of them were astronomers, and they were doing lots of work on black holes. And so they were talking about this with this politician, this British politician, and he got very excited. And he said, these black holes, he said, are they British? <laughs> this is the problem of when politicians get involved in science policy. And it's happening potentially in China. So to conclude, we have a big challenge for our world. We have a big challenge of the unruly uh, but slowly advancing world of Plan S, but we have an even bigger challenge. Does China become part of our scholarly communication system, or are we forced to become part of theirs? And I think that's the really big question which we're going to have to look at over the next decade. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have a microphone up front. So please use the microphone if you have questions, so, because the session is being recorded. And please, when you introduce yourself and your institutional affiliation, when you have a question. Hi, uh, Craig Van Dyke from the Clocks Archive. Um, if you said it, I missed it. Why France and Germany have not signed on? Um, complicated. Prospects? It's complicated. I didn't mention it. In the case of Germany, it's to do in part with their constitutional law about um, freedom for um, their authors to have choice. In the case of France, I don't know, but CNRS has not signed up. I'm, I'm from France, right? I can give you some, some details. Please do. Um, the main funding agency is the ANR in France, and the ANR is in. So CNRS will follow because CNRS is aligned with the ANR. So it's not a matter of signing, but uh, CNRS is not a real funder. It's just like a university, just like uh, Ephraim and other research bodies. So I think CNRS will never sign it, but CNRS will follow the plan S because ANR is saying. So it's not what, what you said about France, I think, need to be a little bit corrected. I don't know about Yeah, yeah, Germany, no, that's fair enough. That's yes, the situation in France is clear. It will follow the plan S. Uh, Manfredi Lamanna from the University of St. Andrews. I am an economist. Uh, thank you for the clear uh, exposition, uh, but I'm afraid it perpetuates a, a misunderstanding. Um, the object of open access, as you correctly said, was the author's approved 
manuscript. And yet we talk about article processing charges. These are two very different animals. Uh, the author uh, approved manuscript comes out of a work process that is done mainly by, by academics, for academics, and for free. The cost of that process are very, very small. Your assumption here, and it was also repeated this morning at the first plenary, is what is called revenue equivalence. And that's why the publishers, of course, don't object to Plan S, because they don't care where the money comes from, as long as it's the same amount of money. Now, I can give you some figures. If we take an example of, let's say, Elsevier, uh, they have uh, revenues for $10 billion, and they have some figures for what they call pre-publication costs, which would be the cost of producing the AAM. Do you know how much that is? It's well, large, in, it's large <laughs> inflated, large inflated. It includes payment to editors to keep them with Elsevier. They are $222 million, i.e. 0.02%. So, that is the problem. If we paid, if instead of talking about article uh, publishing charges, we talked about what is the object of open access, the figures would be very different, and the publishers would not like it. Well, that's an interesting point of view, and I'm not here to defend anybody, I might add. I, my days of doing that have long since passed. Um, but I do think you should ask yourself, were it so cheap and so simple, why has not the entire universe flipped over to this cheaper and simpler model? And the answer is because it's not all about cost, it's about organization and it's about branding. And the reality is that the value of the titles is in part due to the investment that's made in finding, keeping, changing and ma maintaining the up-to-date attractiveness of those titles for an author community. It's not just about processing matters. And by the way, the entire universe of journals is worth about, in terms of revenue, uh, in the STM report, is worth about just under 10 billion US dollars. So I don't know how Elsevier has managed to have 10 billion US dollars. That doesn't quite work out. I think you must be, you must be including other things that they're doing there. And I don't think that's their turnover either. But leaving that on one side, that's not an issue that, that I, I can get into the debate. You need to talk to them about that. The reality is that if we are to do something that's going to work, we're going to have to have a system where everybody's actually being able to uh, continue to provide a lot of the services that people, scholars, want. If they do not want these, or if they think they can be done cheaper by someone else, they should go ahead and do it. It's as simple as that. We're in a free market. If people can do these things cheaper, they should try and do them. But they haven't done. And so the question has to be, why do you think that might be? Now, I'm not going to suggest I know the answer, because I certainly don't know the answer. All, all I'm trying to do is to give you a, a snapshot of where we are in this whole process. And that the reality is that the problems are more to do with where the current funding sits rather than whether or not we can go from state A to state B. Because in my view, state B is perfectly stable, state A is relatively stable. Getting from A to B is where the big problem lies. And there's no easy solution to that, because if there was, it would already have happened. And we've been talking about moving to OA for 20 years, and so far we've got to about 35%. So I think if there were simple solutions, we would have found them by now. I just 
got this idea from another conference and I, uh, or another presentation rather, and I thought that maybe you'd be a good person to uh, share your thoughts on this. Wh who, um, do you think that there's going to be intermediaries that are going to do the work of collecting APCs or other charges from myriad authors and figuring out discounts and you know who who's affiliated with with what? Um, what do you think that space is going to look like? I think there's already elements of that in development, um, and, and I think it, it is a it is an issue because the big issue is going to be given that the average paper has about eight authors on it, how are you going to divide up wh whose funders pay for what? And there aren't currently, I don't think, um, a clear protocols about how, how that's going to happen. Now, you could have the situation that the lead author is always the one that pays. So that'd be one way of doing it. But you've then got to make sure that everybody in the, in the world sort of agrees that that's what they're going to do. Um, there are certainly lots of different people looking to create bodies that will essentially um, do some of the different parts of the process. Uh, so you already have organizations like Publons doing some elements of peer review that's portable. And you already have aggregators uh, and people like High Wire Press doing other elements of that process. So I don't see any reason why you wouldn't get other elements of that. And certainly the collection of uh, APCs for the 3.5 million uh, articles, uh, uh, certainly at one level, is going to prove very complicated indeed. Um, because you're essentially moving, if you think about this from a business point of view, you're moving from a world where there's about 15,000, 20,000 institutions, and that's the basis of set upon which you would be collecting revenue for a subscription environment, to one where you've potentially got 3.5 million uh, individuals. And of course, that's a very much more complicated environment to work in. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It's just it's a different process. And, and I think you will need different people to help you with that. Um, the bigger companies will probably try and do it for themselves. I think the learner societies and the smaller publishers, of which there are the vast majority, may find that they need somebody to help them with that, in which case that becomes a pretty viable business model, I think. Anthony Watkins in Cyber Research. Um, Michael, I went to a pre-conference seminar by, put, put together by SSP, and the assumption was it would be the corresponding author, and people are working on that assumption for this particular problem. I, couldn't, I don't know why they're working on that assumption, but somebody must know who went to that seminar. Well, let, let's hope that everybody's in, in agreement about that, because I think uh, the potential for Confusion is uh, well, enormous. Considered. Is enormous. Uh, I can say, as a as a researcher, that there's a lot of debate generally about who comes, who's, which is an important position. It varies in different fields. In mathematics, it's also always al alphabetical. For example, I know that much. Uh, but but there's uh, the, the customs between one field and another don't uh, have are different for where the the most important author is, and it's never the corresponding one usually. That's well, and the other complicating factor, of course, is different disciplines have entirely different grant structures. I mean, uh, and if you're going to have APCs that need to be paid in, say, mathematics, where grants are not normally that great, I mean, you know, we're talking about pencils and paper and lots of brain power being the requirement for a mathematician, it doesn't require equipment in quite the same way that some other um, uh, research areas do then that's the challenge. That's a very big challenge. And certainly the people that I've been speaking with in the arts and humanities area are very concerned about that. So I think it's not clear. One size does not fit all. And we've got to learn that, that actually we, we slowly evolved our world to enable um, difference in the past. We're going to have to try and make sure we allow that difference to be maintained in the future. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for coming. Um,